Meredith Marks needs a bathtub, you guys. Come on. That is the main. And like the fact that Meredith Marks spent the entire episode complaining about not having a bathtub, that to me is iconic behavior in terms of housewives. Today, I've got with us Ryan Bailey of So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey. He is a pop culture guru and he's here now with us on pop culture. So what a perfect fit. Welcome, Ryan. Wow, a guru. I mean, this is that's that's so close to like cult like figure. And I've been watching so many cult documentaries that I'm scared to even be called a guru. But thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. Well, I hope you've uh, dove into the Mother God saga because, wow, oh, that, that took up my I, whole weekend. <laughs> I, I've been drinking colloidal silver ever since I've seen it. Can you imagine? Like, she turned blue on that. It was wild. Yeah, I tried to get people into it, but they saw the first two minutes. They saw the blue <laughs> face. They said, I'm out. <laughs> Wait, but what does that say about us that I saw that and I was like, I'm fully invested now? Oh, absolutely. The phone went down at that point. (laughs) (laughs) I said, I'm in. Well, I'm here to talk to you about everything pop culture today, but I first want to hear about you and how you got into pop culture. Was this something that was in your blood or was there something that specifically kind of sparked your interest? Well, listen, I grew up in a small town. I mean, Olathe, Kansas, I grew up there. And you know, we were on this block with a bunch of kids. It was a really amazing way to grow up. But a lot of the guys liked sports and all the girls on the streets loved music and tv and movies and i just kind of more loved the girls and their tastes and things of that nature and it's always been that way so you know you're not exposed to tons of that when you grow up in a place like that but i was so addicted to like entertainment tonight access hollywood anything that i could get my hands on and the dream of just there was a place called hollywood out there you know you would see it on entertainment tonight and you would see that hollywood sign and i just thought everything about it was so magical and i love the fact that these things were being made that the behind the scenes uh things and this is kind of pre-reality television like that got added into the mix a little bit later but i just thought it was the most magical thing ever and it was one of those uh you know kind of soothing things for me even as a kid to just plop in front of the tv and just kind of go away disassociate which a kid probably shouldn't do but i would yeah. but it was just those kind of like movies tv music that turned into my sports like even watching housewives today i mean that to me is how my guy friends react to their favorite teams but it's always just carried over and i've just I, I, I get such great joy out of all of it. And there are so many of us that great, get great joy out of it with you because uh, So Bad It's Good is fantastic. And there are so many episodes. I have no idea how you do it. Yeah, but, it's wild. Yeah, How do you sleep? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't. It's it's really good. But, but by the way, when you do something that you love, I was always told this because I kind of, I, I've been an actor for a long time. And one of my acting teachers, Leslie Kahn, used to say, you know, like it, it's that old adage of if you, if you do what you really love, it's not work. I mean, the hours yeah. that you put into it. But at the end of the day, I still laugh. Like I was talking about last week, I had to read the situations book for an interview. I had to watch a docu series for an interview and I had to watch all the housewives. And I just sat there and I got stressed for a moment. And then I laughed. I was like, this is the dream. Right. You've reached the pinnacle of having to read and watch watch these things for your job. So to me, I, I truly get it's it's the best part of my day doing anything involving this show. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. The homework for these kind of jobs is uh, delightful (laughs) homework. (laughs) Yeah, it really is. Well, and the podcast has grown so much. Now you're part of the Betches network. Amazing stuff. Tell me a little bit about how it's grown and how you've grown with it. Well, I mean, listen, I started this about four years ago. It was like right around the pandemic starting. And I had a whole different career. I had worked at this acting studio for 13 years. I'd been on The Office, How I Met Your Mother, Criminal Minds, voiceovers, commercials. Uh, but it was one of those things that it was like you weren't the captain of your own ship. You were kind of dependent on which audition you would get and would usually be like barista worker. Like, here's your coffee. And those things, it was a really, it's a really hard life. But I always loved watching reality television. I always loved this. So it was kind of this natural progression of starting to guest on other people's podcasts that did reality and then thinking, could I ever possibly do this myself? And uh, it started, you know, I started it. And then during the pandemic, it kind of really started to take off. But I made it like a variety show at first where I would do six hour episodes once a week. And so I would do like two guests. I would do my mom and dad. I would do comedy bits because I grew up on like drive time radio. 
And that kind of uh, found a little bit of an audience. And then I was able to get acquired by another company. But the thing was, is that I had my eye on Betches, uh, you know, like just tooling around the internet, you, you get, uh, you kind of fall in love with certain companies yeah. and certain people. And I had Sammy Sage, who's one of the founders of Betches. I had asked her to do my podcast and she did. And I just thought, these are the people that I want to be around. These are the these are the people that's going to help me go for, uh, go further. That's going to inspire me. And everything with batches, uh, I kind of align with their views. Now it's primarily driven towards female, but I believe I have a really strong uh, female taste. But I also look to females. They're all, also like everybody in my life that I truly have loved so dearly, like my mom or my best friend. They're all women. And uh, I, I don't want to be the head of the table, but I just I'm so excited to be at the table. And Betches has been so amazing because I just really wanted to be a part of a team. And that's what they have there. Like everybody there is just working and they have the best sense of humor. I was able to visit the office a bunch uh, in the last couple of months. And they're just having conversations that I want to have on a daily basis, but they're gearing it towards work. They're like, hey, what do you think about this Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey thing? Or <laughs> can you believe the Vanderpump Rules thing? And I'm like, this is the coolest office I've ever been in in my life. The best water cooler conversations in the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was all nervous. I was like the new kid. I was like, can I just jump into this conversation? And I was like, oh, my gosh. And then you realize, like, I'm like. Uh, you know, I, I'm a dude with a, you know, I'm like this weird, like, I was just like, I want to hop in. Is it all right to hop in? And they've just been so welcoming and so nice. And their reach is, is really insane what they've managed to do, uh, since they started this company. So I'm just, I'm really privileged. And I kind of shout it out on every show because uh, it's a pinch me moment to be with a company like Betches. Well, it's certainly, I mean, the pod has been fantastic, but I feel like you've been getting some like really, really wonderful interviews lately. Uh, the, the situation you brought him up, that was great. I may or may not have cried when he was sentenced to prison time. So, you know, that was that was especially right? good for me. Yeah. I mean, I that, with him it, about like that. I. Well, it was amazing because uh, his book actually was was really fascinating. I wasn't aware of uh, how deep his addiction went. And I always talk about the reality behind the reality. So we as an audience are presented this kind of what the producers want us to see. And it's wild and it's crazy. But what I'm finding as I get deeper into all of this stuff, that the reality behind all of this stuff, you can even use Kyle Richards as an example this season on Beverly Hills, where they're trying to present this, you know, Sutton's trying to bring in this relationship issue. We see all of these changes, but Kyle is trying to protect this and you see this fight. And I can't wait to find out like a year or two after this, what Kyle was really going through. So it was wild to, to that situation because I'd been a fan of the show for so long and to talk to him and get to to read that book, it was really amazing. And that's a special shout out to a Betches team member, Ali Friedlander, who makes these things happen. It's kind of a dream where I'm like, hey, could we possibly get this person? Could we possibly get this person? And she'll go out and do that. But it's so exciting because I want to talk to everybody. Like, I, I mean, I wish I could do 30 episodes a week. And I know that's not feasible <laughs> and it would exhaust everybody. Yeah. But I feel like what an opportunity to talk to all of these people that I've been a fan of and that I have questions for. I am. Somebody called me a fangirl the other day. I think it was not as a compliment. And I was like, hell yeah, I'm a fangirl. <laughs> yes, I am a fan. I, I completely am. But I try to even with that situation, I like try to get it away a little bit from your standard cookie cutter interview and kind of like, hey, you're a person, you know, I asked the situation, do you ever have down days? And he was like, uh, <laughs> you know what? No, not really. Yeah. No. And it was like, of course you don't. You're the situation. Yeah. You wake up with like positive mantras in your head. Yeah, honestly, it, it really is like an interesting kind of perspective to come at the the, the interviews that we that you do. Was there one interview or one that pump, comes to mind that you were especially like nervous for or kind of prepared a little bit extra for anything like that? This makes me sound like a real dork, but I get nervous for all of them because I oh, truly yeah. care. But it's yeah. one of those things like I'll prepare for every like I'll, if you have a book, I'll read the book. If you have a series, I'll watch the series. Like I'm about to interview uh, this lady who directed this uh, docu series called Let it, Let Us Pray that's on Max right now. Oh, ID Discovery. Great. It's mm -hmm. Really, really intense, and it's a whole different kind of thing because you have to switch your head from like the insanity of reality television to a very true story mm -hmm. about fundamentalism and church and. You know, it's so amazing because I get to go and then research that. And then as a viewer, ask those questions that I think we all want to know while we're watching these shows. 
And you're always trying to do a service to the guest to try to make them look the best they can possibly. But I would say like, this is before Betches, but I remember it was uh, now, it was like not last January, but the January before I interviewed Tom Sandoval and I had been friendly with Tom and Ariana and he, he wanted it at their house. And I was like, okay. And I was so nervous for this one because I really wanted it to be good. And I really believed in Tom and I, you know, I got there and yeah, yeah. I mean, and Ariana's there when I got there and it, it turned into like a three hour epic interview because he just, he brought out all the props. He was playing trumpet. He like, I finally had to say, I got to go, man. Like it's two in the morning. And cause he wanted to keep going. Uh, but it was one of those things of like, this is such an adventure and everybody does have a story. But uh, I think if I ever talk with Tom Sandoval again, I would be insanely nervous for that one just because I would have to be honest with how I feel. I try to be mm-hmm. honest in the show, whether that hurts a housewife's feelings or or not. Right. But uh, yeah, no, I think everyone has its kind of like little spine tingly nervous thing, but it's really exciting because once you get past that first minute, it's just a joy. Right. Then you can relax into it. Is there anyone that you are really putting out there, manifesting uh, someone that you haven't interviewed yet, someone that you really want to talk to? There's so many people, but I would have to say Andy Cohen is somebody that I just admire so much in what he's built. There's only a couple people in history in terms of pop culture. I mean, more than a couple that have actually created a genre that have created, you know, like I wish Andy Warhol was still alive today to actually watch the housewives because I think he would (laughs) dig it so much. And I just think, you know, it's so interesting that Andy was able to be right place, right time, push this idea through and to see what it is now on top of just hosting Watch What Happens Live, being a father, writing books, doing Radio Andy. There are so many things, and he really is the ideal, you know? I mean, uh, there's so many people I admire, but I would just love to pick his brain, not even about housewives, but just about how you do this. What's your mental state at any given time? And when you have so many opinions thrown at you, and also the internet being so prevalent now with all of our opinions thrown in, how do you cut through that noise and still hold true to your vision and what you think is right and push that forward? And and so that's, but I will say, Betches also has one of the most amazing Bravo podcasts out there already mentioned at all by Dylan oh, yeah. Hafer, who I extremely love. He actually just talked to Ariana. So it's it's one of those things where I think we're a good one-two punch when it comes to Bravo, but it's exciting to be able to talk to any entertainment figure. Like I want to talk to Tom Hanks. I want to, yeah. I mean, I want to talk to the lead singer of Counting Crows, Adam Duritz. Adam, <laughs> if you're listening, please, let's talk about a long December. Adam is our number one listener. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Woo. Well, I mean, you brought this up, so we've got to talk Bravo. I'm such a Bravo fan. Obviously I know you are too. What is your favorite show that's either airing right now or is, you know, about to air just ended that kind of thing. Well, right now it's got to be Salt Lake city. It's, you yeah. know, Beverly Hills is, is getting there as a close second, but I think what Salt Lake city did this season is really unheard of because none of us were expecting it to be a good season. I thought it was such a mess last season with the Jen Shaw of it all. And I thought it was this, you know, Jen Shaw always tried to throw everything at the wall and see, you know, try to see what sticks. And I just thought it came off completely disingenuous. It wasn't honest. So I didn't expect much. And I will say every episode of Salt Lake this season has delivered for me because it's also You know, each housewife has its own, each housewife's iteration has its own thing. You could say Beverly Hills is glamour. Mm -hmm. Uh, Potomac, there's a a firecracker humor dialogue at all times. But I think Salt Lake City now exists in this kind of David Lynchian uh, (laughs) bizarre universe that none of these ladies are truly quote unquote friends, but they're all banded together and there's a snowy background and you have choral music at all times of like, oh, 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 there's all of, you know, and there's such distinct personalities like Lisa Barlow, people might uh, dislike, you know, certain actions she takes, but she's unapologetically herself. And I think that is what people respond to on these shows, even like Sutton on Beverly Hills. I mean, she brings out a joint at this last dinner party But you're like, oh, my gosh, I truly believe that people like Sutton exist. I truly believe Lisa Barlow exists no matter as no matter how weird she acts. I believe that's a real person for better or worse. And that gets me glued to the screen. And for me, Salt Lake every week, I look forward to it. So do I. And I also was not expecting to like this season. But did you expect Monica in those first couple episodes to be MVP, you know, releasing her own mugshot? Iconic. 
Isn't it great, though, when you see, like, we talk a lot about first season housewives, and this is what I'm talking about in terms of sports. You know, it's like now I'm like, her rookie season, she's just doing, she's coming up to the plate. You know, Monica's great. I always say on the podcast, she's all colors of the rainbow. Like, she's, you know, she contains multitudes, and some of them good, some of them bad. And I'm so excited because I know we'll now be guaranteed a second season with her to really delve into Wow, she cheated on her husband with another family member. Wow, how did she get under Jen Shaw's wing? Oh my gosh, she did release her own mugshot. I want to delve in deeper to all of those stories. So I think that is very unique for a first season housewife because a lot of them either sit back and they wait for the second season to start bringing a storyline or they throw everything at the wall and it's really awkward and the audience is a little kind of like, ah, like Noella from OC. Like she gave a lot of moments but almost too many moments for a first season housewife. But Monica, for some reason, I think it's because it's that group of ladies has kind of cut through that noise and has really become a fan favorite. And I'm not saying she's perfect. I'm saying a fan favorite, even with like, she probably did a lot of very bad things that are going to be released in episodes to come, but still the desire for her to share that with us is wild, but it's also great for the audience. The fact that we have so much going on this season that the Bermuda thing, just no one even really knows what that is. No. That's wild to me. But isn't it great, too, is that we don't even really care? Like, I'm like, oh, we'll see it when we see it. We've got enough to focus on right now. Meredith, Meredith Marks needs a bathtub, you guys. Come on. That is the main. And like <laughs> the fact that Meredith Marks spent the entire episode complaining about not having a bathtub. That to me is iconic behavior in terms of housewives. Yes. Uh, Storylines are great, but sometimes I just need a bathtub fight. And and (laughs) Meredith is is always giving. (laughs) And she was like slurring. She almost looked dead in a scene. There was a medic there. There was a medic there that came in to check on her. And only one person actually from the group checked on Meredith. They were like, well, try to rally. And she's like with a medic, like just totally looks dead. And I just thought, how amazing is this? And still the medics there, no one will give up their bathtub. I wouldn't either. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand the bathtub obsession. I'm a, I guess this is where I'm actually where I'm a guy. I don't understand laying there and I feel like the water gets tepid and then you're just laying in your own filth. I don't know. I just I'm trying to understand the allure of the bathtub. You know, for me, it, it would just be like, well, I don't know. And you seem fine. You're drinking with us later. So I'm not giving up my whole room. <laughs> Now, Salt Lake City is obviously super interesting, um, but I'm very excited for Potomac later in the season. I need—I think we need to move past this whole Wendy, NECA. Th- they clearly know each other, right? Like, I'm, I'm sick yeah, of Yeah, they, they clearly, and this is the interesting thing about second screen technology, which I also talk about a lot on the show, mm-hmm. is that it's not just the show anymore. It's the show yeah. behind the show. And I always, I would love to pitch Bravo a weekly show of, what the audience missed in social media this week, because there's always three other things happening in regards to the show happening directly on social media. And I think a lot of people sometimes get lost in where did this fight go? Where? And I think Vanderpump Rules season 11 is going to have to deal with that a lot because a lot of us already know a lot of the events that are going to be covered on this season. So it's really interesting time. But yeah, Potomac is one of those things that I'm sure it will heat up, but we've had so many great seasons of Bravo this season and already airing like Beverly Hills Salt Lake, Married to Medicine is killing it this season, that Potomac is not delivering the way Potomac usually delivers. But this is another, I I don't know why I'm using so many sports reference. You can't be a Fairweather fan. You got to stick with these shows. You can't be like, oh, I didn't like three episodes. I'm out. No, these are our family. You've got to stick with your family because these ladies will always deliver. And just, just anytime Karen Huger opens her mouth, it's something delightful that makes me laugh that I I just it's it's meditation for me to watch Potomac you know she's heading for a triple 20s we've got to support her (laughs) (laughs) I I want to know what happened with the candle lines we had competing candle lines with Wendy and Karen where are we on the wick situation how like we be we should be up to eight wicks by now yeah please let someone check in on that (laughs) now I I agree I'm kind of waiting for it to heat up but they always deliver but you brought up Vanderpump Rules, and I am very interested in this. I know you have a personal connection with uh, the Vanderpump crew. Where do you think they're going to go in season 11? Because I'm excited, but I'm also I'm a little nervous for everyone. I'm nervous for everyone, and I think it's going to be interesting to see how the audience responds. Um, and this is the hard thing, is that like Tom Sandoval is going for a redemption season, right? And 
we don't have Rachel on this, so we're going to hear a one-sided story or two-sided when Ariana talks about her side. But this happened between three people, and one of those people did not do the show. So Tom is going to be able to present a narrative that he might believe, but it might not be the actual truth. And I think that can be a little dangerous of he's going to say, and we even heard it a little bit this week on uh, Teddy and Tamara's podcast that oh, yeah. Tom and Tom were on, where he taught like, I was so in love, dude. I, I tried everything with Rachel. He presented himself as this good guy that did it all for love. And I just imagine if we heard Rachel's side, it would be a little bit different. And I think it's interesting because if we're going to see a whole season of Tom still not really accepting responsibility for his own behavior, I think the audience are going to rail against that. The other thing that I'm looking out for, which always frustrates me, is potentially turning Ariana into some sort of villain because she got great success from this. And I think it's so interesting, you know, uh, Ramona's Ramona Singer's line of like, you don't support other women is right. that I sometimes get frustrated and I don't understand where I've seen it online, where people are like, oh, she's had enough. Oh, she doesn't deserve to be on Broadway. I'm like, what do you think Broadway? Yes, she does. She's a great dancer. She's a great singer. This is Broadway does stunt casting all the time. Right. I think it's interesting that people only want women to have so much and then they get too much and then they turn against them. And I always see that. Well, I got cheated on. I didn't get Dancing with the Stars. Of course you didn't. You're not on a TV show. Yeah. I, I think I think it's going to be interesting to see. The show itself, I think, will be what it is. But I think what will really be fascinating is to see the audience's reaction, to hear my podcast, to hear other people talk about it, and to see where we land. Because we also have to be very cognizant of what story the producers are trying to tell this season. Um, you know, they always try to tell a story and they will edit towards that. And I was talking, I was at this great variety party at Spago last week. I was like over the moon to be invited. It was like the top 40 women in reality. And I was talking to one of the producers of Vanderpump Rules, and we were talking about the new season. And he said, listen, you know, uh, it's not going to be season 10. Like season 10, we have to realize was lightning in a bottle once in a lifetime. And that production crew over, over there just killed it in terms of being able to capture that moment and to be able to string it along through all of these episodes right up until the finale. I just thought I've never seen people, you know, kind of capture that, ride that, but also come through that last episode. Scandaval was, I think, just one of the best reality hours I've ever seen on television. And that says a lot. And in 2023, to still have things that can affect you deeply. I've talked to so many women about their own stories with men cheating on them. I've talked like to have that kind of conversation based around a reality television and to have it break national news. I was so proud as a reality show fan of see, I'm not wasting my life. See, this is, a, we're all talking about this and it's, it's riveting. It's on CNN, you know, we're yeah, all yeah. Tom hated here. that. Yeah. Tom, he's like, why am I on CNN? But at the same time, Tom loved it. Tom loved it. Tom felt like a star. He even admitted that this week on the interview. He said, part of me felt like a star. And I think that's the thing. The Vanderpump Rules thing really, ex you know, is so fascinating too, because these are all started as bartenders and barbacks that wanted to be television, music, and movie stars. And instead of that, they became reality show stars. And they live in this kind of really interesting nether region of wanting to keep this going. And I, my secret hope with season 11 was all them fighting over who got the best brand deals. Like, wait, you're working for that company? I was supposed to get that company. I want that kind of honesty because you saw every one of those cast members ride that wave, you know, send it to Daryl shirts, all of these things. Oh, yeah. It, it gave that show such a jump start after the previous two seasons um, that I was just like, it was really fun, fun and funny to watch them all kind of ride that wave of attention again. I call it the Vanderpump economy, the attention economy. You know, <laughs> we only have so much attention to give and they got all of it during that season. They really did. And I, I can't wait to see what happens next. I hope it's just as good, but in kind of a different way. Um, but where, 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 I, sorry, where, where do you stand, Anna? Are, well, like, are, where are you at on the the Tom and Ariana stuff at this point? I'm not over it yet. I know some people are like, I'm played out with with Scandaball. I'm not over it. I don't need to dig into all the the tiny little details anymore. But I do want to see the dynamics and how it plays out. Like like Sheena at, at BravoCon, possibly hand, hanging out with with Sandoval. How are people going to bring the group back together? Because they do want to stay on TV. I, I mean, I think that's the underlying theme well, of all these people is that they all want to be on TV and they can't do that if they're not filming together. Uh, Kiki and I talk of shame. Who's on Betches oh, yeah. as well. She has a great podcast called pop crime. 
uh, we did shenanigans with Sheena this week mm -hmm. for a little pop culture thing. And we did the Rachel having a podcast story. Oh, and gosh. it was fascinating to sit right. First off, Sheena played her Christmas single that just got released with Lala. And she played right. it for me and Keith. Like she, I didn't even realize that was happening. Like we were there on Tuesday and all of a sudden she was like, listen to this. And we had to sit there with Sheena listening to two and a half minute single. And I was like, this is, I love my life. This is yeah. so bizarre that I'm saying, but then she brought up the Rachel podcast and it was fascinating to hear her talk about it. And I told she, and I said, listen, you know, this is all winding towards you and Rachel will speak again. It might be on your podcast. It might be on hers. And she was like, oh, there's no way. And I'm like, you can never say there's no way, especially in reality television, it will happen. And that's what I'm interested. That Rachel podcast, she's got a real opportunity here. If she really comes correct and tells us the information we want to know, but Rachel's never been an effective communicator. So I always worry about podcasters in general of why are you doing this? Are you doing this for the attention or do you actually have something to say and you'll stick it out and build an audience? And I'm really curious where Rachel goes with it. I hope that she really zeroes in on her story and, and tells her st side of a story. So, but it's not just Tom Sandoval on, on Vanderpump telling his side. Yes, but I exactly. Have a feeling, I have the feeling, but she's not going to quite get there. Like you said, she's not like the best communicator. So I, I'm, I'm a little nervous for her. But I will say that's why you need to listen to So Bad It's Good because we yes. will be recapping the entire Vanderpump Rules season and I will incorporate Rachel's podcast to try to give you a 360 view of everything that is happening in Vanderpump land. See, that's why you're the guru that I brought up at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ryan, before I let you go, where can uh, people support you other than So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey? You know, so bad it's good with, with Ryan Bailey is that's that's the thing. That is yeah. that is everything I want to do. You can follow me on Instagram. I make a lot of silly memes, but I will have some, uh, you know, actually pop culture information on there. We have the YouTube channel. I have a Patreon where I even do more episodes, which you don't need because you have so many free episodes, but we get even goofier over there. We have a sub stack with holiday gift recommendations. There's a lot of places to support me, but I would just say the podcast. There's a lot of episodes, so pick and choose. Read what you, we do recaps. We do pop culture roundups. We interview great guests. And uh, it's one of those things is, as Tom Sandoval says, dip in and <laughs> see what suits your fancy. But I think there is something for everybody there. There's a lot of my own personal life that I talk about going through grief, just losing mm -hmm. my mom. Yeah. There's a lot of. Uh, you know, I have my dad on to talk about his process. So I always think about the show as a mashup song. Like mm -hmm. it's ever, you know, like two things put together. So it's personal, it's reality, it's pop culture. It's all of those because I think the listener and our listeners, they do like everything. We can't just be pigeonholed into one thing because I love everything. And I know there's a lot of people like me out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it has been delightful talking with you today. Uh, so much fun. And thank this you. This is so amazing. Much. I, I got, I, I could go on for three hours like I do with all the podcasts, but thank you so much for this opportunity <laughs> to speak with you. This was such a of great course. way to start my day. I really appreciate it.